Early on, people began asking, what about pets during this pandemic? Can they catch it? Can they transmit it? And as the lockdown persists, an even wider swath of animals gets drawn into those questions. What about livestock and wildlife? With us for more on the animal side of this COVID-19 situation, we welcome in Guelph, Ontario, Dr. Scott Weiss, Chief of Infection Control and a professor at the Ontario Veterinary College. And in Toronto, Dr. Ian Sandler, veterinarian at Grey Wolf Animal Health, Inc., and Phil Nichols, the COO at the Toronto Humane Society and a registered veterinary technician. Gentlemen, it's good to see you today for this uh, program on a bit of a different angle in the COVID-19 story. Why don't we just, uh, why don't we start with this? Uh, Phil Nichols, how do animals actually help us at a time like this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's really important to keep in mind the human animal bond and that value that animals bring into our lives every day. Um, certainly, if you're going to be stuck inside your house, the best place to be stuck inside with is with your dog or cat or other um, pet that you have at home. They, they have a number of health benefits for humans and their companions. And they're great companionship in general. Keep a smile on your face. I noticed the other day uh, I read a piece about the uh, animal shelters in New York City, and this is for fostering. And um, they're running out of animals. I mean, they have a nice problem. Uh, there, there is such a demand right now for animal companionship, given where we're at. Is there something you think, though, that we should be mindful of as we isolate with our pets these days? No, I think the, the foster response that shelters have seen across North America has just been astounding. Um, New York has emptied out a number of their, their shelters of animals. Uh, Toronto Humane Society has done the same and numerous other shelters across Toronto have. Um, it's, it's a good time and it's a good opportunity to be able to be home with those animals and the foster uh, parents as they're going through, through that um, period of adjustment and adaptation. Um, it's good to be home more frequently with them so they can adjust us, we can adjust to them. And that, that transitory period that we normally see when, when animals go into foster homes is often difficult because people are coming in and out and there's a number of different routines. So being able to do it while everybody's in quarantine, I think is actually a good benefit. Yeah, Ian, maybe you could follow up on that. Is there anything we ought to be doing differently now that we're with our pets 24-7 as opposed to before when maybe we only saw them first thing in the morning and then after we got home from work? Yeah, I think our dogs and cats don't know what's happened to them, let alone our kids. Uh, in reality, I think the biggest thing is that you just want to try and keep to some kind of a routine. So most importantly, it's okay to walk your dog. Some people will walk their cats. So certainly uh, there's no issues with exercising. But again, a pet's really just an extension of the family. So social distancing is very important when you're out and about. I think the other thing is because we're in such close proximity with our pets right now, uh, inside the house or the apartment, we don't want to over overfeed them. So uh, we can you know, kill them with love just uh, in the sense of you know, inadvertently giving them too many calories. So um, they really respond well just to our verbal communication and our touch so you can be very close to them there's no issues with that uh, most importantly the reality is if you are uh, positive for COVID-19 or if you're showing clinical signs and if you've been diagnosed you really want to social uh, distance yourself and self-isolate from your pets as well as as people in the house well that really raises a question Scott that I've probably been asked uh, 50 times uh, since this whole thing started and that is uh, what studies have been done to indicate whether or not uh, we can get COVID-19 from our pets or, frankly, whether they can get it from us? Well, not enough so far. This is a virus we've only known for a few months, and as a human pandemic, human work obviously takes the priority. Uh, animals, we certainly have some concerns about them. This is predominantly, if not purely, a human disease. And differentiating predominantly from purely is really the goal right now. Is this only driven by human-human transmission, or is there maybe an animal aspect where we're spilling it into animals periodically, uh, and maybe have an animal health component or a human health component? It's a minor thing. But a minor thing for a big problem is something we still want to pay attention to. So at this point, we don't have great evidence, but we're trying to balance being practical and being prudent and erring on the side of using practical measures to reduce any risk that might be there. And what about farm animals or livestock? For those who are watching us from uh, more rural parts of the province, uh, how vulnerable would their, those animals be? 
Well, fortunately, livestock don't seem to be an issue right now. Like I said, it's fairly early. There have been some experimental studies, and we've been worried about a few species based on the original SARS virus, which is closely related to this one, and looking at the genetic makeup of this virus. We've been worried about cats and ferrets, and those ones we have seen uh, susceptibility of them to this virus. Pigs were also a concern based on the SARS virus. Now, it's fairly early. But there have been some experimental studies now with pigs and with poultry, and they haven't been able to affect them, which is good. At this point, we're not saying no livestock stock aren't susceptible, and we're still the same messaging, kind of like Ian was saying. It's social distancing. If you're sick, sick stay away from your livestock. The risk to them is probably very low. The food safety risk is basically zero, we would think. But it's easier to say, okay, if you're sick, stay away, socially distance as much as you can, then we don't have to worry about it. And one more follow-up, and not that this is going to be a huge problem in the province of Ontario, but I am curious. Lions, tigers, bigger beasts, what about from them? Well, lions and tigers are a good story because of the Bronx Zoo, which many people have heard about, where there was a tiger diagnosed with COVID-19 and probably the same disease and some other lions and tigers there. Ultimately, they're cats, right? So it's surprising, yeah, it's an interesting species, but it's still a, an infected person, presumably infected a cat. And just in this situation, it was big cat not a domestic cat. It just shows why we have these concerns, right? Because there are certain species that can probably be infected by people, and we want to reduce that so we don't infect them from an animal health standpoint, but we don't want to create a situation where they might be able to send it back to us. Now, we, we know that in certain circumstances, we can get human to animal transmission. We don't know if they can give it back to us, but we want to be prudent and try to reduce that. So I think the lion tire story is interesting, but they're just cats. Ian, let me get you in here on this angle. Uh, I note, um, I guess a couple of weeks back, when the province of Ontario released its list of 70 or so plus businesses that it considered to be essential services, uh, veterinary services was on that list. So what are the services that you are providing that the province apparently thinks are essential right now? Well, I think this is beyond uh, Ontario alone. So I sit on the National Issues Committee of the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association, and we represent over 12,000 veterinarians across Canada. And I think, you know, we when we look at this, we think about certainly in, in downtown Toronto, what does it look like for an urban clinic uh, in the city? And it's certainly not business as usual. But, you know, when you're talking about people like Scott that have such uh, an important role, um, you know, in, in all sorts of aspects of, of both animal health and how people and animals interact together. Uh, obviously, uh, it's not business as usual, but from a federal perspective, and most of the provinces have followed suit, uh, clinics are considered essential services. But just like human hospitals that have canceled many routine procedures or delayed them, uh, it's not business as usual. So we are absolutely there uh, for pet owners in all different uh, types of practices right across Canada, whether you're in a large urban setting or a rural practice. But again, I think what, what you're seeing now is veterinarians are really trying to address a few things. Number one, they want to make sure that if your pet is sick, if they're uh, undergoing chronic uh, emergency services, that you're able to still um, be able to assess the clinic or access the clinic. But um, you know, most importantly, they, they, they do want to also ensure that the staff is uh, is protected. So if you need to go into the clinic, uh, you're able to drop the clinic off through, let's say, curbside, drop off and pick up. You're still able to pick up um, prescription medications and therapeutics. And I think that that's really important for pet owners to know that veterinarians are in many ways a, a frontline service and, and we are there for them. Yeah, I think, Ian, uh, you know, many people obviously have a tough enough time determining whether or not they fear they themselves have COVID-19. I'm not sure what kinds of symptoms you would be looking for to see whether or not you thought your pet might have contracted it somehow. Uh, can you help us out on that front at all? Well, again, to, to, to Scott's point, we think the likelihood of, of domesticated animals, primarily dogs and cats, uh, to be infected is extremely low. Now, dogs and cats can get other kinds of upper respiratory tract infections. And even the tiger in the Bronx Zoo, um, you know, had mild coughing, but it, it, the symptoms were very, very mild. So people uh, right now, COVID-19 is a very, very complicated disease process. Uh, and part of the problem with COVID-19 in people is that the incubation period can be long. Uh, and people can be fine uh, even during the first you know, phase of sickness, but then uh, it can advance into more um, serious types of, of, of issues, not only just 
respiratory. Um, but certainly we think, as, as Scott has mentioned, the likelihood of this being a problem in, in domesticated animals is very, very low. I think the critical point is if you're experiencing uh, a cough, if you're having temperatures, um, if you're spiking fevers, if you have all of the sort of classic early signs of COVID-19, um, you really need to self uh, isolate and self quarantine yourself from from your pets as as well as your family members. Scott, this may be a bit of a nutty question, but if you suspect your pet does have COVID-19, however it might have picked it up, I mean, surely the test can't be the same thing as it is for a human, which is really unpleasant, the, the sort of sticking the Q-tip up the nose and leaving it up there for quite a long time. What, what's the test for an animal? Well, it's basically the same thing. We stick up something really? similarly in a couple of different places. Yeah, the, the question is, um, there are a couple of different aspects here. One, do the animals get sick and do they get sick enough that we need to test them? And one thing to remember is every time we go to get a sample from an animal, we require a person to be there, for one thing, to bring the animal in to us or for us to go sample that and to handle that because your average cat doesn't really appreciate a swab getting stuck up its mouth or its bum. So we bring in human contacts, which we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to limit the amount of animal sampling that's happening. And we can sample them through swabs up their nose and in their mouth and in their rectum. That's our, our typical uh, pair or set of swabs that we collect. But we don't want to see this done really on a routine basis. From, from an animal health standpoint, dogs seem to be pretty resistant to this. There have been a couple of dogs that have been infected, but they've been healthy. Um, cats can get sick, but like Ian said, they're, they're fairly mildly affected as far as we know. Ferrets can get sick, and they're maybe the ones we're most concerned about. But, you know, we can test them, and we can do a very similar test to what's done in people. It's the same concept. Uh, but ultimately, we want to find a reason to do it. We don't want people saying, okay, I'm worried about my cat, so I'm going to bring it into a vet clinic, I'm going to expose a bunch of people to my cat and to me, and we're going to get a result. At the end of the day, what I'm going to say is, well, if you're sick, stay home with your cat. Like, keep your cat inside. You can pass it back and forth all you want, but it's going to burn through both of you at the same time. So we're trying to really encourage that social distancing aspect. There are some situations we want to test them, and we're doing surveillance to figure out how much it's moving back and forth. But for your average pet owner, uh, from the animal health standpoint, there's not much to be concerned about, especially for dogs and realistically probably for cats. And there's very little indication to call your vet or go to your vet to get a, uh, vet to get a test, uh, apart from really specific circumstances when we're trying to answer kind of big questions about how it's moving. Hmm. Phil, are you having many encounters with COVID-19 at the Humane Society? No, we haven't. Uh, we haven't seen any cases so far at the Humane Society downtown. Uh, we've certainly been in contact with people that are very concerned uh, about what's going to happen if it does if it does get in the shelter. But um, as a number of other clinics and, and shelter than doing are relying very heavily on expert advice on building and, and establishing our own protocols. And and I think our senior veterinarians have been in contact with Scott almost daily. So we've been very um, pleased with everything that we've been able to get support for. Have you taken any of those phone calls from concerned members of the public? Um, no. <laughs> I presume you've talked to your yeah. colleagues, though. When those calls come in and people are concerned or they're worried about what's going on, uh, what are they talking about? So I think a lot of them, uh, similar to the questions you've already brought up, a lot of those concerns are, you know, can I get this from my pet? What do I do if my pet gets it? Do I need to bring it into you if it gets sick? And can I bring it into you if it gets sick? Um, how do I handle the situation? And we've been echoing a lot of the sentiments in response to that. And, and um, taking our cues from from other industry experts and field experts on what the best advice is to them. And we've been, again, reinforcing that that messaging of social distancing and making sure people just stay present of mind when they're when they're concerned about those things. A lot of the concerns have been, well, you know, if I'm if I'm in social isolation and I need to get there, how do I get supplies and how do I ensure that I can provide appropriate care for my pet? And that that has been more of the focus of a lot of the questions that we have been getting. And it's one of the reasons we've needed to really um, bolster and, and re-support our food bank and the delivery programs and supporting those agencies that do home deliveries for people that are in high risk demographics so that they can have pet food to deliver to the homes at the same time as well. Have you had to scale down your operations much since the COVID-19 outbreak began? Well, that's an interesting question. And I think it, it's very, when we talk about scaling down, we certainly scaled down certain aspects of our operations and that other aspects of our operations have, have really jumped up. Um, so we did um, our rescue transport where we used to do a lot of um, rescue and transportation of animals from higher volume shelters in because we have that we have a good adoption capacity within Toronto. So that program has kind of wound down. But when this all started, we had to get the majority of our in shelter population uh, out into foster homes and the response from the community 
was astounding with that. And, and we've placed, I think, upwards of about 280 animals in, into foster care at this point in time. And we've really had to augment. So we've we've gone as um, Scott and, and Dr. Sandler were saying earlier, is we've transitioned over to a telehealth model. So our veterinarians are just as busy, but they're doing telehealth consults with our foster parents now, where before they were seeing the appointments in shelter. Hmm. It does raise the question though of if and when this thing ever ends, and we assume it's going to come to an end at some point, should you brace for yourself for, uh, you know, a bit of an onslaught of animals coming back into your care? So that's something that I'm not overly concerned about ourselves. When this, when this whole system started up, a lot of our practices on making sure the animals had good outcomes required animals and, and people to come into the shelter to do adoption. So our adoption team has been working um, really hard at augmenting and adjusting all of those procedures. So we're still completing adoptions. We're still moving all of those animals forward. So we're, we're transitioning our systems, but we're still trying to keep all of those life-saving numbers the exact same and, and improving and touching as many lives as possible. So I'm not overly concerned that we're going to have a large flood um, coming in. I think it's, from an isolation standpoint, we, we're still able to, to process adoptions and we're doing that in, in a low contact and in a minimal uh, crossover. And I think it, it's going to give people a lot of opportunity, provided they take it, to build and strengthen the bonds that they have with their pets while they're, while they're stuck at home with them. Scott, I heard a mention of telehealth there. Now we know what telehealth is supposed to do for humans. What does it do for animals? Well, it's the same idea. It's providing the healthcare uh, as many cases as we can without having to physically lay our hands on the animal or be in the same room as the owner. So in veterinary medicine, we're having to change a lot, as Ian was saying before. Uh, some of this is getting the animal curbsides. So we're not interacting with the owner. But there are some situations where we can at least even just triage and figure out, do we actually need to see the animal? Is this something we can handle through a phone, FaceTime, Skype, whatever console? And there are certain conditions where we absolutely can do that. There's certain things we can't. If I got a broken leg, we can't fix that by the phone. But there are certain things that we can do to reduce the number of animals that have to come in. And it's that balancing, minimizing the number of people that are coming in the clinic to, to maintain social distancing, but maximizing the amount of animal care that we have. And telemedicine has the ability to fill a gap there. Hmm. It's interesting, Scott, because I, you know, we just heard myriad stories about what a lack of resources we have right now for humans, and uh, perhaps our viewers may understandably come to the conclusion that it's probably even worse for, for animals, and that uh, under some circumstances, maybe, maybe folks who do what you do have been poached to go chip in and help on the human side of things, but are there adequate resources right now to deal with the problems that our pets would have? Well, we're limited. So some pieces of equipment we have are very specialized and have been taken to the human healthcare system. Ventilators are one thing that most of the veterinary clinics that have ventilators, which is a small number, have donated them to, to human hospitals. Uh, many clinics have donated supplies. Yeah, there are some drugs that they're short of that we don't use much of, so we can't really contribute to much of that. The personal protective equipment is the one where we're certainly seeing limitations in what we have. We don't tend to use the N95, that, the better quality mask, because we don't have that same high-risk patient that the human hospital is dealing with. So, so clinics are able to give those up quite readily or not use them. Other things we have to work our way around, like gowns and gloves and surgical masks, things that we need to maintain kind of good, safe operations, safe for the patient, safe, safe for the veterinary staff, but also make sure that we're not taking things away that the human hospital needs down the road. And that's an ongoing discussion. The ministry sends out requests periodically or the various groups that are feeding information, trying to balance, making sure that we can have the best impact we can um, supporting the human healthcare system while still hopefully maintaining you know, our urgent care mandate. Ian, maybe you could follow up on that and tell us how the animal welfare industry, um, you know, from time to time helps the general healthcare worker in this province. Well, again, I, I think Scott has, uh, has, has commented really appropriately. So groups uh, like veterinary associations on the provincial level uh, and on the federal level have really jumped in and said, okay, what, what can we do to help? Right now, um, healthcare is still being uh, administered, if you will, on a provincial basis. So each province is still maintaining uh, their control, if you will, within within you know the health environment. Um, I think what is what is really uh, you know interesting about COVID nineteen, just as a as a virus, is it's um, if, if you listen to you know many of, of, of the public health folks talk about this, um, you know, good hygiene practices are so key, and they talk about washing your hands for at least 
20 seconds. So we know the envelope or the outer coating of the virus um, is quite sensitive to, you know, just basic soaps and cleaners. So I think from a welfare perspective, um, most veterinary clinics, most people working in animal health, you know, fill uh, within a humane society environment. We are so sensitive to any infectious uh, disease coming into um, that area that most clinics um, and, and veterinary se settings are very common um, you know, cleaning surfaces frequently. So the good news is uh, veterinary environments are actually used to uh, really appropriate infection control. And yes, we may be short uh, from some equipment, but I can tell you every clinic in Humane Society is uh, and are wiping surfaces down uh, constantly and really trying to maintain um, separation. I think the other thing that you're seeing, for example, in the clinic that I work at, we're reusing um, masks. So, you know, we're getting very, very creative at trying to make what we have uh, really extend the shelf life, if you will. Now, is that something you would have done under normal circumstances? No, I mean, again, this, these are not normal circumstances. So I, I think the thing that, that that's just incredible to see, because I certainly, um, you know, was around when HIV broke in, in 1980 and certainly MERS and SARS, We've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this in, in my lifetime. And I think if there's good news, you're seeing the coordinated effects between provincial, municipal, and federal governments. You're seeing uh, international communication and cooperation on many different levels. I've never seen the speed of pace for um, the work towards a vaccine and towards you know possible treatments for this. And, and we've heard a lot of them on the human side. So I think we've got to look at the silver linings. There's, there's potential a lot of good that can, can come out of this from an education and understanding perspective. And if international groups work in cooperation, I think that's very key. I think what's scary to me as a veterinarian, and I think Scott would agree, is that one of the things when you look at pandemics, when you have um, the idea of, of One Health or this concept of having people, uh, animals, together in very, very close proximity, especially wild animals, the likelihood for um, these kinds of diseases to emerge, and we can talk about Ebola, we can talk about MERS, we can now talk about COVID-19. I think we really need to address uh, in reality how we interact with, uh, with our animals and our pets. And I think the role of veterinarians in understanding disease management uh, and disease control is critical and certainly we've heard of the closing or, or the, the wantingness of international groups to close these so-called wet markets um, certainly raises a, a lot of discussion around this and, and the potential for other uh, pandemics to, to emerge. Scott, you want to pick up on that and, and I guess we should just say maybe you could take a moment to describe what the concept of One Health with a capital O and a capital H uh, what that philosophy entails and whether you think it got a shot in the arm as a result of this pandemic. Yeah, well, One Health basically is an approach. Um, it's the intersection or the relationship between animals, humans, and the environment. And when those things come together, we've got a One Health problem. And this is a classic One Health problem. It originated in animals and wildlife. You've got the animal and the environmental focus. It moved to people. It spread around people. We've got potential for spread back into animals that we're paying attention to. Um, did One Health get a shot in the arm? I'm not really sure because once this became a human disease, it was basically approached as a human disease without a lot of interest in the One Health side, quite frankly. Uh, I think there'll be some retrospections thinking, okay, how do, we, how do we handle this? I think the big thing where the One Health side will come through is how do we prevent the next one? Because there will be a next one. This is not the last virus that's hanging around somewhere waiting to find the human population. And we're going to see more as we move more into areas that are previously wild, as we move animals from those areas into densely urban areas, as we get urban expansion. All these things increase our risk because every human animal contact, just like every human human contact, poses some risk. And the more novel that is geographically, ecologically, the greater that risk is. There are viruses out there that are similar to this virus, most likely. They've been estimated there are a million plus undiscovered viruses. And if only a small percentage of those are a concern, that's still a big enough number. So China's just recently announced a, a draft protocol to reduce the number of animals that can be farmed, limit the number of species that can be farmed. And there's a lot of pressure to close the wet markets where they're bringing in massive numbers of, of live animals 
of domestic and wild origin and massive numbers of people, it's the perfect mixing ground for something new. So I think we're going to see a lot more thought about how we interact with animals, how we interact with the environment. How do we prevent this from happening again in terms of preventing that first jump from an animal to a person, which we can't completely prevent, but we can reduce the risk. And then how do we get on top of it quicker? Ultimately, though, the general line is 60 to 70 percent of emerging diseases are animal in origin. So it's, it's another good reminder that we need to be thinking about how we interact with the environment and with animals in those environments. Phil, apropos of what Ian just said, do you see any positives coming out of this whole pandemic by the time it's all said and done? Yeah, that's a great question. And I do think there's going to be a lot of positives that come out of this um, pandemic at the, the end of the day. We're already starting to see um, policy and protocol changes um, in China, as it was alluded to, with the meat markets and, and changing how uh, animal factory farming is done. I think we're going to see some some big positives come out of that. And at least, if nothing else, more awareness on, on One Health. Uh, the biggest change and, and the biggest impact that I think is going to, going to happen for animal welfare is really with respect to telehealth and the College of Veterinarians of Ontario at any rate has been very well in advance of um, telehealth policy and protocol and allotments for veterinarians. But the, the quick shift over to that telehealth model has been really positive and I think will have long lasting impacts on, on the animal welfare industry. Um, in, in the sheltering world, we talk a lot about barriers to access of care and that barrier to access of veterinary care really is the, the predominant thing that causes animals to need to enter into a shelter. And that's often not at the guardian's fault, it's it's on the fault of the system. So at, at Toronto Humane Society, we do a lot of work trying to remove barriers to care. And one of those barriers is financial cost. But the other barriers that we can look at removing is is the actual physical barrier. A lot of people have cats that are afraid to go into the vet. I froze. And being able to reach those clients and those pets directly in their home without them needing to go around um, and go through that stressful process, I think it's going to be really, really beneficial. And if we can keep a lot of the practices and the augmentations to to care delivery um, in the systems, I think we'll actually see a lot fewer animals coming into the shelters. Uh, Ian, why don't you come in and talk to us about how are our pets going to adjust to a brave new world when things get back to normal and we're not around nearly as much in the future as we have been over the last three or four weeks? Well, first and foremost, I think, you know, industries like dog walking uh, are going to pick back up again. So for many people that have been at home, you know, something as simple as as, as canceling daycare or dog walkers, I mean, all of that has, has come to a precipitous um, stop right now. So I think you're going to see, you know, dogs and cats going back to um, daycare, grooming, uh, things like that. So I think you are going to see, um, you know, slowly as the population gets back to a normal routine, things will get back to normal. Uh, again, you know, I, I think social distancing still will remain uh, very much so intact for probably a long period of time. We know that in many cities, dog parks are closed. And the reason that is, is that it's no, we, we you know, we'd love to have, you know, our, our pets uh, hang out together just like we would people. But right now, that's just not appropriate. So this idea of social distancing is key for both our pets uh, and, and ourselves. The, the risk of transmission, as Scott mentioned, um, you know, even if we sneeze, let's say, uh, if we're infected and we sneeze on our dog and our dog goes outside and theoretically comes in contact with someone um, who isn't uh, exposed, theoretically, that could be a, a carrier or a fomite for um, for transmission, but we think that's very, very low. But nonetheless, this is, again, just an example of where social distancing is going to remain uh, more of a, of a long-term you know, concern. But I think in terms of our pets, things will get back to normal. Uh, everyone's hoping that it'll be sooner than later. And again, as, as Scott uh, mentioned, we, we think the risk for transmission within our pet population is quite low. Mm. Scott, last 30 seconds to you. I'm sure there are cats who are uh, miserable right now to have the uh, owner home as much as he or she is and they'll be no doubt thrilled once uh, they've got the whole house to themselves when this is all said and done uh, but for dogs dogs are looking at potentially lonelier days ahead when this is all done how do you think the impact of that will work itself out well, I think animals well, adapt like people will most of the time, but I think there will have to be some concern about behavioral issues where dogs, especially newly acquired dogs, their life for their first three months or whatever was full time, all time, all outside with owners, and now all of a sudden they're alone for, for a while. So I think owners and veterinarians are going to have to be on the lookout for potential separation anxiety or other behavioral issues because of this massive change in lifestyle for a newly acquired dog. Your older dog's probably going to brush it off. Most dogs can adapt, but there will be some 
repercussions probably on the behavioral side. Can I thank Scott Weiss from the Ontario Veterinary College and Dr. Ian Sandler from Grey Wolf Animal Health and Phil Nichols from the Toronto Humane Society. It's good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight, or at least uh, from my attic at home. Good to see you all. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.